Hey everyone, welcome to Cover Cult ETF Investing and can you believe it, it's already been a month since the last tracker video was released for February. We are looking at all of the nitty gritty details for March in this video. If you're new to the channel, um, I've created this uh, spreadsheet. Um, hopefully it's easy enough to use. I've, I've tried to keep it fairly simple. There are little notes at the very top that kind of explain which column it, what, what every column is. But I wanted to make this because I was just frustrated that there wasn't good consolidated um, information out there. Uh, right, I'd have to bounce around from fund manager website, go to all these different websites to try to, try to cobble together um, what sort of, I, I, um, opportunities that there are with cover call ETFs and especially uh, red flags as well. But I've created the spreadsheet so we can identify that all in one place. So it's $13 a month. You can find it, uh, the link to it on my homepage or it'll be in the comments below, pinned comment uh, or the description below if you wanna be part of the Patreon community and uh, just accelerate your education with this. I think it's just, an awesome tool. I want it to be the undisputed best tool for cover call ETFs out there that is updated on a regular basis. Uh, with that being said, uh, one of the big, also big things I do with this tracker is I do regular updates, but also I do kind of these sort of bigger monster updates. So in this case, this month's big monster update was I've added a bunch of um, American funds. Uh, about 59 or so, so you can kind of see there, yield max curve and just uh, global X defiance, 59. There's certainly more to add. It takes a lot of time to enter that stuff, but uh, I'll continually add funds month after month, even if they already exist, plus new ones as well that hit the market. But for today, we're just looking at um, Canadian funds, and then two days after the release of this video, I will do a video on American cover call ETFs, and, I and we'll do the exact same format that I'm laying out here. Um, we'll be looking for uh, opportunities and we'll be looking for red flags as well. So without wasting any more time, let's get to it. Uh, we got, I think something like 120 funds now in, uh, for Canadian funds. I think if we, if we count, if we count up all the funds, yeah, it's gotta be something. It's gotta be something like that. What's the count at 128. Okay. Uh, so first things first, let's look at yield because yield, I put it in bold, forward yield. That is what we're looking for going forward. You're not looking at TTM, 12 month trailing yield. Some of these look kind of strange, but like uh, mainly that's just because maybe some of the funds are newer. So it only has say two or three months of data or of yield to compile, even though the fund itself is um, maybe a 12% yielding forward yielding fund. Just a little bit of um, education there for you newer income investors. Now with this, um, we're I'm looking at a view only format of this, which is what you all would be seeing. Um, you, the, I got a little filter here, but in order to create a filter, um, we just click on uh, the second uh, row there, we'll go up to data. Let's create a filter view right there. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Make that a little bit higher for you all to see. Uh, a little bit more screen in there so we can capture more information. Um, let's go actually go through yield. What is some of the biggest yield that we have going on here? Uh, so Tesla, once again, is in the top spot. It was in the top spot last month. Uh, Tesla has certainly been hit over the last little while, so its yield is naturally the highest. But of all the other funds, ENCL, no surprise there. I think that takes, once again, second place. Bank, BKCL, HPYT, HMAX. I think the usual suspects are kind of in the top 10. UMAX, right? Like all the diversified funds across North America, the sector funds that you see here in Canada uh, are all near the top. Now, I know I, for my channel, I focus on 10% plus yields, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in yields that are, are say, below 10%. You know, I really, I'm, you know, Base is a fund that I'm watching, uh, Evolves Global Materials and Mining Enhanced Yield Index ETF. Uh, so 9% is in a range, say 9.5 to 10. Uh, that's when I'm starting to get interested in maybe some of these funds. Um, current yields, like I own HTA, AE, 
Uh, I bought it at, I think, $13.55. That's my average price, and that's good enough for, I think, 11.5% yield. But um, tech's been on quite the roll. I think price-wise, I'm up 20% on it, which is just not what I expected, I got to say, when as I've kind of gone through this cover cult ETF journey. Um, what else do we got here as far as, yeah, yeah, we're kind of getting into territory. I think most of you, you know, are not necessarily as interested in, especially if you watch this channel, you're looking again because of that 10% plus, but you can obviously explore that for yourselves. Um, we won't really go through, we won't go through price or, or say the day's volume. Oh, keep in mind that for these trackers, I, um, take info from the last trading day of each month. Uh, that's when all this info, especially the performance stuff gets compiled. So all this info you're seeing is based on February 29th. Uh, let's quickly check on, as we kind of rip through this, uh, yield, what is some of the most liquid stuff? Three month average, like daily average volume. Uh, we got HPYT taking the top spot that's been, I think in the top three for the last three months. Uh, good to see HMAX is at the top there. No surprise there. I think Hamilton, of, of course, has that reputation. They call themselves the financial sector specialists. And um, HMAX continues to grow. I think it's now a year. It might be, is it two years old or one year old? I believe it's one year old now. So uh, good for HMAX continuing with awesome liquidity. We like to see that. No issues there when you go to buy it within your brokerage. You're not going to say get surprised and get charged an extra you know a few cents on every share that you buy but if we head down the list here to say some of the more e-liquid um funds it's going to be stuff like the dot u funds um again the dot u dot b funds you see here uh sort of the more um the funds that are, are are kind of, for lack of a better term, kind of hiding under the log, right? Like out in the woods. <laughs> you're not you you you're not going to see it. You necessarily don't care to see it. Um, but either way, I would say this because I've been getting questions about illiquidity. Why does it matter? Well, we can also use a liquidity um, in combination with AUM just to just to keep tabs on funds that are potentially in trouble. We know that not all of these funds are going to stick around for five, ten. 20 years and maybe you depend on investing in some of these funds for maybe that am amount of time so as long as you stick with the channel uh, i'll continue to document all that and we'll try to identify funds that could see um that might have issues uh with longevity into the future um in my opinion kind of anecdotally maybe under anything maybe under about a thousand is kind of in that wheelhouse of of just be careful with if you're going to invest in some of this stuff. Um, as I've said before, with the liquidity, how that can actually impact you. It doesn't matter the brokerage you're using. When you go to, say, buy and you get to that preview page, I think it's there. It'll say, you know, um, the market price. It could be slightly higher just because there's not enough trading volume on it. So because of the bid ask spread it could be a lot higher. If it's not training, that that bid ask spread could be a lot larger. So just understand that um, Ill, more you know illiquid funds could potentially give you um, it could end up costing more. Now I've I've personally bought uh, I used to buy this like bond fund like a couple years ago, and it was very illiquid, but I had no issues with it. So um, just something to keep in mind doesn't mean you absolutely will pay more. It's just again just something to be aware of. Uh, let's avoid 10 per, we got to keep rolling through this because um, we're already at that <laughs> we're already uh, we're already well into this video still lots to cover okay when we talk about um, identifying opportunities and um, and and what kind of sectors or funds that might be uh, worth having a look at we're gonna go through say the six months I think six months is a good uh, range to look at because I think the past six months is is sort of our our current economic environment if we go farther out we're capturing other economic cycles right so uh, if we were to if we were to only filter this by say three years well now we're capturing you know COVID we're capturing the bear market of 2022 probably the tail end of the bull run 
Um, we're capturing inflation, we're capturing interest rate high, we're capturing kind of all of that. It's not something we can't, but I think six months is probably good uh, range to, to uh, with the current economic cycle we're in. So if we go to um, one week past performance, the last week of February, we can see that, um, what do we got here? What is what the best performing stuff? Now, if you look at all these uh, ticker symbols, you look at all these fun names, it might, you know, it might not mean much to you, but if we, but a little, I guess, a, a little cheat for you guys, uh, if you're wondering what sectors are kind of doing the best in the past week, just roll over on over uh, to a uh, fun category here, and we can see that basically in the window that you're seeing, what is it? Technology. Technology in the past week has absolutely done the best. So, you know, um, and if we go one month out, uh, what is doing the best one month out? Okay, again, more technology. We're getting a little bit of healthcare in there, which is you know interesting to see. Healthcare, not again, not often talked about. We don't really have that much of a private healthcare industry here in Canada. It's not to say we absolutely don't, but uh, it's very U.S. driven uh, in that regard. I would say that probably the best sectors in the U.S. are you know technology, healthcare, and financials. Um, and then when we roll out, say six months, now we look at all this, and that's also just to keep in mind that th these are the best performing, they're the top right now. Nece you, perhaps you're someone that doesn't wanna buy necessarily at the top, but who's to say that it won't keep growing? So again, technology, crypto. So we understand now what sectors are kinda doing the best in the last, say, six months. Um, what about, what about the opportunities? If we just looked at the best performing stuff, and so maybe the best performing stuff, technology, you maybe you avoid that, wait, wait some time until uh, technology softens. Um, I mean, I bought HTAE at 1350 and I thought that was like the top and now it's somewhere in the $16 range and my price performance on it's 20 plus percent. So not to say that it won't keep going higher, but at least looking at sort of the trend line over the last six months, what has done the best, maybe you look for other opportunities somewhere else that you can extract value out of. So we'll go down to, <laughs> we'll go to the underworld of performance in the past week. And what are some of the industries that we're seeing? If we say follow along where say the line where ZEB is, we're seeing financials, real estate, eh, we got a single stock in there, financials mining utilities mining all right so we we kind of already have a baseline we got mining we got utilities and i'm seeing some financials in there and there's only one um, real estate fund so there there could be something there uh let's look at the past uh, month uh let's go let's go kind of scroll up a little bit there okay and what are we seeing again we're seeing the past month okay bonds is kind of in there what am I seeing again? Utilities. We got some uh, Canadian financials in there. We got uh, we got that single stock. So a little bit of single stock ETFs. I'm I'm, I'm kind of more looking at the um, oh, I'm kind of more interested in the the funds at this point, uh, the sector funds, the the diversified funds. So we see utilities. We see some mining and Canadian financials and um, you know, HPYM, HPYM.U, very new. I think it's like a month and a bit old. H bond is in there as well. Uh, so, okay. I'm already getting an idea of what sort of funds have been kind of underperforming over the last little while. Let's go to six months, right? Again, that's our current kind of economic window at the moment. Um, uh, and we'll head over. What are we seeing? Energy, fi financials, utilities, and mining. Well, you know, I would say this over the last six months, you know what, what, over the last six months, what, what has it been? It's been mining. Clearly it's been mining is at least maybe you're not necessarily care about mining, but if you're, if you're, if your sole purpose is looking for opportunity, there might be something there. Uh, G C G X F and G L C C have gotten beaten up pretty good, especially in, over the last six months, down 20%. Ay, ay, ay. And over the last week, um, especially as tech has done well, as always, when a certain sector takes off, there will be an always be an underperforming sector somewhere else. That is just 
the realities of the of these economic conditions with the stock market there will always be opportunities to find somewhere so mining could be something for me mining um i, I mean i did a video on it uh it's it's probably a little bit higher up as far as six months ah oh there it is okay so for me, what I'm interested in is actually base, uh, evolve global materials and mining enhance. I'm not really, I don't really care about gold. I'm, I'm, I think you guys know that already. But as far as like a diversified set of um, rare earth minerals, um, for, especially for uh, sophisticated semiconductors, well, this is the, the farthest upstream part of that supply chain you could possibly get. So for base for me, I kind of want it to hit about 10% before I invest in it, but it's within that wheelhouse of interest uh, at 9.53%. So again, you can find opportunities here, but you just have to look for that kind of that consistent trend line of underperformance over the past, say, six months. Sure, you can go a year out, three years out, five years out, but again, there's been so much change in the last five years. You got to think, 2019, uh, the economy was was just chugging along good. COVID, <laughs> right? Supply chain bottlenecks. Um, now we got geopolitical issues, sovereign debt crisis, inflation, interest rates. Like if you were to encapsulate the last five years, it's pretty hard to find. Like there's been so many different um, economic. Well, I would say you know opportunities in the stock market, and they've come, they've gone. So keep keep that band fairly tight to say the last six months in my opinion and i think we can we can certainly find opportunities within that that the current window that we're in um so with that being said let's move along we still got so much to cover um uh, management fees uh i will update these probably not for april but for may as MERs typically change once tax season comes around and I want to make sure it's all captured. So if I can get it for the April, uh, if I can get it for the April update, then I will. Uh, but definitely for May, uh, these MERs will certainly change. And, and also some of the management fees I know will also change with probably within the next bunch of months. I know some of the Horizon funds, their management fee will change after about a year's time from when they're... Um, they had a bunch of funds that they released and fund changes, well, structural changes to the f um, to the fees. So anyway, that that I'm very aware of and will continue to change over time. We won't look at moneyness or portfolio coverage. The only thing I'll say about this, especially for newcomers, uh, the higher the portfolio coverage generally indicates, you know, the more premium typically you'll get, especially with moneyness in combination with that. At the money at 100%, very aggressive. Uh, you not much upside, but you're gonna get you get probably some good yield with that. Whereas it's say 25% out of the money, less aggressive and more opportunity to grow over time. For all the newcomers out there, um, I'm not dividend streak. Uh, we can sure we can kind of touch on that. Uh, not much change here. Uh, the only change which we captured in last month's video, as far as a as a, a, a dividend streak that came to an end was Blov, which had about something like 63 months or 64 months came to an end. But as far as significant uh, dividend streaks that have come to an end, um, nothing, nothing significant has come to an end. Uh, so let's go back up to go ticker. All right, moving along over here, you'll see this is, uh, now we get into like distribution information uh, we can see the date of the first dividends paid out first distributions paid out and then we have february and march this first column here is distributions month over month so what has increased month over month and we will look at that so the biggest increase we're seeing is month over month is nvidia with a massive 17.65 percent change um, and then we have, we're rounding it out with a lot of the Hamilton products, which naturally when they go to pay out in, uh, um, when they go to pay out in March, uh, HYLD and HDIV 
they've now completed their, what they call their internalization of the funds. So these funds, HOLD and HDIV, are no longer investing in third-party cover cult ETFs. It's all in-house now. So things like QMAX and SMAX make up a lot more, a bigger weighting inside uh, portfolios or inside the funds like HOLD and HOLD and HDIV as well. Um, since they have those newcomers, uh, LMAX, EMAX, AMAX, and FMAX. Uh, and even QMAX and SMAX see a little bit of a bump as well. Good to see uh, for, for their distributions. And then we go through, but after that, it's, it's boring. But you know what? That's a good thing. Um, as much as I know it, it's, there's not much to talk about when there's month over month change at 0%, but it just gives credibility to... How, how this industry has continually matured and it's stabilized. And with cover call, well, cover calls in general, typically the premiums, they bounce around. It's based on volatility. So it's not like a traditional dividend that you get from, a, say, a, a company like Enbridge, where maybe the, the, the dividend will most likely, especially if it's on like an aristocrat list, meaning, you know, they've been paying out for a long time. Uh, they're continually going up and up and up without without going up and down, up and down. And really nice for those stocks. Uh, well, it, it lends lends well for predictable dividends to invest in, whether you want to live off of them, uh, say, in retirement or if you're near retired. But cover call ETFs, at least here in Canada, are continually impressing me with how they're able to stabilize these dividends and continually maturing. But... Uh, as far as month over month, again, nothing crazy to really report on here. UMAX and HMAX, I own both of them, both down month over month, 0.35%. UMAX lifetime, since it released in, I want to say it was June of last year, down 2%. This is within, I would call it, that's within the realm of stability. It's down 2%. There is nothing to, to worry about there, uh, especially for the fact that it owns pipelines, communications, um, what else does it own? Uh, railways, you know, I think it has um, other services like waste connections in there. Um, I consider UMAX critical infrastructure. So for me, um, we need it no matter what. If we want industry to continue to chug along here in Canada, UMAX is certainly going to play um, an important role in that. Uh, then we got HMAX, uh, again, a year old, down almost a percent, down 6.49% over the last uh, let's call it since its first um, distribution last year. Um, I would say with HMAX, it's it's still high yield. I think it's in the 15% range. It's something to watch. It it, it kind of goes under the radar for me a little bit just because when it does decline, it declines by these little amounts. It's not like a, a it's not like a sudden drop. It it kind of goes down a little bit, might creep up a little bit, it goes down a little bit. So it's kind of a, a situation of one step so one step up, two steps down. One step up, two steps down, and they're and they're and they're micro small when it comes to that. So some just to look out for. I think in Canada, a lot of great competition for um, Canadian financials with the banks, right? BKCL being one, bank being one. If um, if you don't want the leverage, BKCC is um, another one that you can certainly pick up on. And if you want something that's totally boring and conservative, there are things like uh, BFIN, which invest in North American financials across Canada, the US, or um, ZWB, 50% coverage, and it's out of the money, but again, smaller yield at in the 7% range. But you, again, pick this thing up and you can explore that for yourselves. So we've basically gone through the entire tracker looking at um, opportunities. Uh, let's actually roll through ye the yields so one thing with the yield tracker and all these sort of individual trackers, AUM, um, average three-month yield, this is really to give us a baseline over every single month how these yields have actually done since yields change based on based on price. Distributions may not say change, but you know, you could get essentially a bigger discount with by identifying where certain yields are at month over month. So let's look at some of the biggest monthly changes in yield. Uh, right, we got to put on a filter view. So let's do that. Filter view. And then we'll hide this. All right, month over month change. What do we got here? Month over month, 
at right at the top. Oh, we are not including. We are not including U.S. stuff in this video. Sorry, guys. Um, the month over month change. We're seeing uh, things like right well you know what fund manager wise it's kind of just all over the place but again if you're looking for opportunities just you can check out the yields here if the yields going up you know the price is going down so over the course of the last month well what's gone up things like why google has gone up um glcc that mine that gold cover call etf that we were talking about it's the yield has gone up 10 percent from 12.39 to 13.69 okay that's there's, that's great there. So good opportunities in here. And then we kind of get into, you know, the, the, like minor changes over the month. I still think it's good 5% change, right? If you go from 11.39 to 11.9 in things like HYLD. And that obviously has to do with, um, in this case, that this isn't uh, based on because price went down. It actually just has to do with that internalization that we talked about. And they got rid of their management fees from those third parties and they could lower their own fees. Well, since those fees are gone, um, f overall fees got lowered. And um, because of that, it's gone up. Um, month over month, it's gone up 4.49%, where the price was roughly a month ago. Um, yeah, so, and then we kind of go down to the bottom here. What has, what has decreased the most over time? Um, we can see the... The yields that have struggled, that have just absolutely plummeted, uh, BTCY and um, and and uh, Ether have gone down remarkably. Now, this is a bit of a trade-off. You know that um, Bitcoin and Ethereum have just gone uh, gangbusters on um, the on financial markets. They're the best performing assets out there currently, and I mean. If you're in, if you're in it for the yield and stability, uh, sorry to say, uh, with crypto, you're not necessarily going to get that compared to like other um, financial assets, right? The, they're quite volatile. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure those who are into BTCY and EtherY, you guys are doing really well with this on the on the price end. So, um, yeah, yield has gone down, but your price has gone up, you know, remarkably. So anyway, I lots of good stuff to identify there. We can quickly touch on month, um, say January between, so year to date, so January to March. Um, the yield that has increased the most has been, uh, what is this, uh, txf.b. Um, I'm... Uh, that's gonna that's kind of a weird outlier. That's something I think I might want to look into uh, a little bit more just because the month over month seems more in line. So why it's at 2.8? Well, I shouldn't mention that um, CI does quarterly distributions and so they can fluctuate way up or way down. So in that case, um, also point to mention uh, yeah, the yields are based off of the last distributions that came out in, in December. So keep that in mind with the CI funds. If you see it in um, the in the tracker, just know that those distributions were based on the last distributions in December, but they'll be picked up in the April update um, when their distributions come out later in March. Uh, other big changes, uh, let's see, I mean, Tesla is still way up because their you know their price is tanked. Uh, what else do we got here? Let's look at some actual funds that have there where the yield. Okay, base base base's yield has increased from eight point seven eight to nine point five three. So again, as you all know, I'm interested in base. I'd kind of like to hold it for. I would like to have it for a long term hold. So this is again a trend line that I'm keeping note of. And a good thing I didn't buy into it at the time because because I've been patient and waiting, its yield has risen 8.62% based off of this from 8.78 to 9.53. Uh, what else do we got down here? Where the year over, you know, BKCL, not much of a change there. Again, kind of hovers in that high 15% range. Bank, I know a lot of you guys like bank. 
um, slight increase over time, but uh, as we saw with opportunities, financials, I think it's still a really great time to pick up financials. Uh, let's kind of look at some of the the, one, the ones that have taken, say, the biggest hits over the last, say, couple, well, since year to date, we got Ether, Bitcoin, single stock ETFs, uh, tech. So maybe what I should do, um, now that I see this, is what I should do is like, I have a filter here for, you know, um, Canada and the US, but what I should also have is a column here also for fund category. So again, you can kind of see what sectors um, are at the bottom or at the top when it comes to identifying um, opportunities and red flags. So that will probably definitely be in a tracker. So even even I, during these videos, can sometimes identify things that are like would help, I think, make the tracker better in the long run. All right, let's go into AUM. Let's throw on another uh, filter view here. Let's get that, create a filter view, nice, let's do this. I like looking at AUM, uh, mainly because I like to see what kinds of inflows, what kind of outflows there are, and it gives me an idea of the general health of the cover call industry. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we, if we filter year to date, um, what kinds of, so we'll notice there's a bunch of spots here where there's no month over month change. Uh, that is because um, these these funds they just got well they oh here you know that's why you know why it's because the U.S. got included again. Okay, so now we're back looking at just Canadian stuff. Um, the dot B funds dot U funds I didn't add them in January. They were part of the big February update. Um, along with the, the distribution tab. That was the big February update. So what do we got year to date? What's the biggest change? The, what has grown the most in uh, assets under management? Well, we can see here bond by Evolve. Uh, Percentage-wise takes the biggest leap from $28 million, $28.5 million in January, all the way up to almost $80 million. Quick growing fund. You know why that is? It's because... You know, I think with um, interest rates potentially being cut, I think there's probably opportunity there. Not guaranteed, nothing ever is in the stock market, but there certainly can be opportunity there. Um, and then as we kind of roll along, cuddle, uh, going from a million to almost two million. So uh, S Max, you know what? Like, yeah. I gotta say, some it would actually help out quite a bit to have the um, the sector tab in here. But again, year to date, we can see uh, we're seeing a lot of green, and then like you look at all the green that you see compared to how much red there is. Like the the worst perform the worst performer NXF. Wow, let's touch on that. I, I wasn't now that I see that boy oh boy two two hundred forty one million dollars down to down almost a hundred million dollars is that because energy is um you know is is no good and people are, are flocking out of it to, because of the ev revolution no I, the, no i think i think there's just simply in my opinion there's just other competition out there with the energy sector now that emax by hamilton is out i think people are flocking to emax because people like the hamilton brand people are flocking to horizons people like the horizons brand for encc and their lever and the leverage uh, fund component to it which is encl and nxf variable distribution and pays out quarterly um i gotta say if ci could just if they change that up i think you know what from a layman's perspective, I think they will see, um, certainly I think there will be more inflows back into, into into a fund like NXF. It's been around for a long time. It was part of, I believe, HYLD, or maybe it was HDIV, I can't remember, for the longest time. So I think the guys at Hamilton, they for the energy component, they really liked NXF. So just a little tidbit there, but uh, as we roll along into a monthly change, uh, we can see lots of green. If hey, well, let's put it this way: if there's more green than red, we are indicating that this um, 
this industry is is healthy and then we go over to three month um, volume let's put a filter tab on it or a filter view I should say and we'll go through how much average volume change has there been all oh, right as always we got to get rid of the US component for the moment um, so Tesla has seen a 1,000% increase uh, in average volume, average three-month volume from December to March, a 1,000% increase. So Tesla is just jumping around like crazy. No wonder they have such a high yield. Uh, but some of these other ones you can see, uh, trading volume is up on all of this stuff by quite a bit. And then we kind of get into the trading volume that is absolutely just horrendous uh let's see why google <laughs> uh yeah why google has this like massive spike in february and then it's back down to kind of the the normal so i'm not sure why that is uh what else do we have there that's kind of notable um at least at least over here now some of these funds again a lot of them dot b.u funds uh, they didn't get they weren't part of the initial launch of the tracker and but anyway what we can use this what we can use this for is you know as time moves on and we can see say month over month we see things declining um, and then we use that in combination with um, AUM uh, what has been decreasing say over time or say year to date these would be the two tabs I, I would want to use as far as you know okay if there is there a fund here that's decreasing okay well NXF has been decreasing month over month pretty remarkably well what about the AUM as well if we're worried about a fund that potentially is on the chopping block again because not all these funds are going to be around for a long time what funds are we going to see that are are going to get um, axed? So let's just use NXF as an example. Where is NXF actually on this here? So as far I oh man I can't even see NXF. I see NXF.U, but where is NXF? It's a it's been around for a long time, so it's not one of these sort of obscure. Uh, cover call ETFs, uh, there it is. Okay, so trading volume shrunk a little bit, kind of picked up in March. But again, you would use um, average volume and use AUM as a good uh, as a good tracker tool to, to see what funds could potentially be on the chopping block. So we need a few more trackers. I would say, in my opinion, six months worth of, of of tracker updates will give us a really awesome bird's eye view. It's getting more powerful. It's getting stronger all the time. Um, this video again went longer than than uh, I would like it to, but um, you know what? Uh, I want to give you guys the proper information. And hey, it's about 20 minutes shorter than the last one, so I'll continue to do my best to tighten this up to try to get all the the right information in here for all of you. Um, we're here also on the distribution tab. This is distribution history of, of all these funds, Canada, U.S. Again, you know, I got the U.S. video is coming, so that'll be again two days after this. So let me all know what you guys think down below as far as opportunity, as far as red flags are concerned. Um, check this out for yourself. It will be a powerful tool, you guys, as always. Um, and. Yeah, just make sure you, you all just check it out for yourselves, learn, educate yourselves on cover call ETFs. Um, I'm, especially if you join the Patreon, you can easily reach out to me. And um, yeah, that's all we need to do. Just keep focusing on the and accelerating our education uh, to get better at this stuff. So with all that being said, hit all the buttons of the like and subscribe variety, and uh, I will see you all in the next video.